Anyway, uh, and now I am, what I am doing now is that I, it's a book of short science fiction stories uh, about the near future, uh, and um, there's five different stories, and so now what I'm doing is I'm writing like the second episode of each of those five, and I've written the first one, and that's on my website now, jennymunch.com. Press a little red button and you can listen to me read the book to you, so it's like an audio video book. And I have those of the other stories too. But anyway, uh, so, but now uh, I have the, 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 fir the second episode of the first one is out there for free if you want to listen to it. And then uh, now I'm working on the second episode for the second story. And that's called You're Only Old Once. And that one takes place in a nursing home. But so what happens is that the residents who are there for various different reasons, um, you know, they're kind of trapped in the building, but they use virtual reality because that's something they grew up with it, you know. And so they socialize and most of those stories take place in virtual reality. So anyway, that's the second story. And I just started writing it. And uh, this is, most of this I just wrote today, so it's all new. So anyway, um, it's just like two pages and a paragraph. Oh, and then something else that's going to be fun. So anyway, uh, you're only old once. Life in the city nursing home had become quieter in Oogle history anyway. Millie had moved into an empty room in Deborah's virtual reality mansion. They enjoyed quiet time sitting together talking, but Millie was becoming restless. Her dark competitions had caused her to have a few extra virtual coins in her virtual wallet, and she wanted to go somewhere interesting. Have you heard of Oogle Future? She asked her friend one evening. Deborah shrugged. The new program looked interesting, but that would require her to learn a new app, and she just wasn't interested in extending that effort. She enjoyed looking out at her flower garden that she had planted, and despite her initial reluctance, the milkweed that Millie had planted was bringing in a variety of large multicolored butterflies. They were fun to watch. Well, I have a competition in a few minutes, Millie explained. Want to go? No, I'd rather spend the rest of the time watching a movie, Deborah mused. I just love watching the movies on that big screen. You feel like you're right there in the room with the action. Millie sighed. She just didn't understand why people spent so much time rewatching movies. She zipped up to her room and retrieved her latest set of darts. She had several, and she pulled out the menu and selected the venue where the competition was to be held. A second later, she found herself transported to the lounge where a crowd of avatars were mingling. It was a multi-roomed complex with basketball courts, soccer fields, baseball, diamonds, hockey, arenas, bowling alleys, and several other venues were where team sports were played. The central lounge where you were first transported had a stage. She glanced up at the marquee that advertised an open mic to begin in an hour. She made a mental note to check it out after the competition. She moved to her venue, which was a large coliseum affair with auditorium seating and a large oval. Millie was admitted to the ground floor with the rest of the competitors. Six start boards were arranged around the perimeter. This wasn't the first competition that she had taken part at in this venue, but it still caused her to marvel at the crowds that it attracted. Her nativity kept her from suspecting the true interest of most of the spectators and that it wasn't for the love of darts. She located the board that she was to be playing at and then quietly waited for the current game to end and hers to be announced. She watched the competition. One of the dart throwers was dressed in a yellow leotard with a red cape. The other was merely a pair of gloves and goggles. The score was close. She could hear a cheer from the audience as the invisible competitor made a bullseye that it was the last turn for the red caped player who took their pilot, their poised, who took their position behind a black mark on the floor. Then each of their three darts flew in quick succession, the last one hitting the bull's eye, marking the end of the match and installing the superhero as the new winner. There were some cheers, but also a few loud voices shouting oaths and complaining at the outcome. 
Millie was surprised at the crowd's strong reaction and marveled at their perceived enthusiasm for the game. She knew that she was to play the winner and wondered if anyone in the stands would be rooting for or against her in this, with the same veracity. She looked up into the stands for a familiar face but didn't notice any. And the next match on board number three will be the current champion Orange Menace versus Millie. There were a few murmurs from the stands and Millie was a bit embarrassed to step up to her mark. She was wishing at that moment that she had created a more intimidating pseudonym for the occasion, but nonetheless she took her dart from her quiver and waited for the bell to announce the start of the match, as it was the custom for the challenger to go first. She tried to clear her head and reminded herself that the game was her form of meditation. She needed to concentrate only on the flight of the dart to its ideal destination. And then she did it. All three darts hit the inner circle and the first and the third landed on top of one another in the very center. There was a mixture of claps and moans coming from the stands. Millie shyly backed away to the sidelines to watch her competitor. The orange menace took their spot and also waited for the bell but their first dart missed its mark altogether, the crowd booed. The next two darts were better paced, one on the triple score ring and the other just shy of the inner circle. Still the score was in Millie's favor and that would remain out throughout the match, which Millie easily won. She also won the next two matches, making her the champion of the day. She was excited to be the grand prize winner. Her virtual coin chest was now bursting at the steams. Happily, she walked towards the exit of the Coliseum, and then the avatar with a pasty complexion, wearing a formal black tuxedo and top hat, blocked her path. He took off his hat and bowed low in front of her. Greetings, I am Anthony Flower, he announced as he replaced his black hat on his head. He was wearing a black mustache that matched his black eyes. He would have been in monochrome if it wasn't for the flower, the red flower in his lapel. Um, hello, she quickly, she answered meekly. I was watching your competition just now, very impressive. Thank you. She was anxious to get away from the avatar since for some reason he made her uneasy. But before she could step past him, he took a place in front of her again. And Millie, he began, I was hoping that you might be interested in being in a competition at my lodge. She stopped, her ears perked up at the opportunity for another competition. Sure. There is a, is there a cash prize? Mr. Flower smiled at her change in demeanor. <coughs> of course. There's a cash prize of $100 for each victory and $1,000 for the tournament. This made her smile as she was still drunk from the recent winnings. Just let me know where and when, she said, as a virtual business card flew from her to Mr. Flower's gloved hand. He clasped the virtual object and then removed his hat once more before bowing and then disappearing. Hmm, Millie mused happily. Her skill was attracting new opportunities, she thought, with a feeling of satisfaction. She moved through the high arched doorway and into the common room with the stage and there at the Masters of Ceremonies was introducing the next act for the open mic. This reminded her that she had planned to stay for the entertainment. She still had 10 minutes left in her VR appointment. And now I would like to introduce one of our regular poets, Minced Meat. There was a round of applause as a pink avatar sporting a bright green mohawk stepped up to the stage. His googly eyes blinked nervously as he began. Tonight, I want to read something that was written by someone else, he began. There were a few sounds of encouragements from the audience. I'm proud to say that I have come from a long line of authors and academics, and my great-grandfather was one of the very vocal critics for change. He lived in Flint, Michigan, during the time when opportunities vanished from the city, leaving its occupants without the means of supporting themselves. 
Homes became vacant. Criminals became, began looting the structures of metal and anything of value, and then bands of vagrants began to occupy them. It was after that that the fires began. His poem is about those long days long ago when Flint was dystopian. It's called Ruin Porn by my great-grandfather, Nick Custer. <laughs> now I'm going to read it. I'm going to try to read it. I can't read it like Nick would read it. <laughs> is he here somewhere? I think he didn't show up, did Coward. Okay. <laughs> Ruin Porn. Perverts treat posted properties like prostitutes. Scrappers are sadists, prying off siding like wrinkled panties heaped across slutty truck beds. Up the street, exploding houses surge with horror and amazement at the ecstasy of gas line fingering. The east side's horny hunger strokes hard through no-ho zones trapping copper for money shots. Behind the rain-soaked blinds, blinds, walls have been ripped down and ravaged by desperate Johns trying to keep up with the Joneses drooling over curly toes, curled toe, claw foot, tubs, and air duct forced to give blowjobs. <laughs> Annealing homes warped wooden legs buckle last long after her spirit and the front porch. She condemns herself with cut and plug mascara caked on to distract from her guttered stare towards another pimp's hand slapping for sale by owner on her ass. The driveway gets shaded by the lashes of overgrown branches. The basement's trashed and rancid from former tenants and cycles of entrapment. Of entrapment. The soul needs to flee before the coffin gets buried or smashed in. Tricks get stripped and teased into foreclosure. And no one seems to care that this is happening. So predictably, does childhoods and ratty pigtails fray away and live, live wires stop sparking, but fiends will still pay anyway. Leaving a busted frame barely standing and another forgotten address soon to be erased from the tax rolls, dead inside, waiting like a bomb to be dismantled. Huh.